<clears throat> oye, oye, oye. All persons having any manner or form of business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit are admonished to give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Our, our first case today is number 19-2041, Benjamin versus Sparks. Mr. Pearson? Yes, good afternoon, and may, may it please the court. We respectfully ask on behalf of appellant Saul Hillel Benjamin that the court reverse the jury verdict due to multiple reversible errors and abuses of discretion, as well as reverse in part the grant of summary judgment on Title VII and Section 1981 and the motion to dismiss. There were four main reversible errors that would have altered the outcome of the trial, the first among them being improper instructions to the jury and verdict form on resignation. That's at 8630 to 31 of the appendix. Most starkly, the verdict form referred to both separations as resignations, even though there was undisputed evidence that Nicholas Sparks terminated Mr. Benjamin from the Nicholas Sparks Foundation. Mr. Sparks testified to this and a termination letter found at 8503 confirmed that he, Mr. Benjamin was fired from the foundation on November 21st, 2013. And there are other record uh, references for that as well. Yet issue three on the form and the district court's instructions asked the jury whether plaintiff proved his resignation from the foundation was involuntary. There was no evidence to support that question. There was no evidence that Mr. Benjamin asked for a characterization of resignation, which would not have changed the fact of his and, earlier termination. Anyway. Why does that yes. matter? Yes, Your Honor. The, the distinction between termination and resignation here is key. In fact, in the summary judgment order itself, the, the district court acknowledged that there was an issue of fact as to termination versus resignation, voluntary or involuntary. The mechanics are different. The legal implications are different um, on whether or not an employee and the implications under the contract, most crucially, are different. If Mr. Benjamin was terminated, that was an, an involuntary separation. If we're going to entertain whether or not he was, it, whether his resignation was voluntary or not, that now introduces a whole other analysis under the Stone case and others, which was discussed at length, um, both on summary judgment and at trial. So to pose the foundation separation as a resignation would confuse the jury and confuse the issues. In addition, posing solely the, the uh, event of resignation with regard to epiphany further confuses the issues since there was, again, much discussion at trial regarding whether or not this was a termination or resignation that was voluntary or involuntary in nature. So it very, very much confuses the issues and in fact contravenes the discussion on summary judgment and that went all the way through this case, through discovery. So the fact that the jury found that- Mr. Pearson, yes. Mr. Judge King, did you preserve all these uh, issues that you're, uh, properly preserve all the issues you're raising? Yes, Your Honor. And in fact, the court noted itself that it considered all, um, all issues with respect to the instructions and verdict form to be preserved because uh, Judge Dever understood that this was not what the parties had proposed. And he, he made that, that statement very clear with respect to all parties. So, um, so the fact that the jury found that Mr. Benjamin's resignation from the foundation was not voluntary, not only is counterfactual, but it demonstrates that the jury was confused and or swayed by several other errors and abuses of discretion, including the admission of improper past acts and character evidence that bore no relevance or relation to defendants after acquired evidence defense, as well as the exclusion of crucial, unique deposition testimony from Dr. Jennifer Duick regarding the, October, the November 21st termination meeting and statements by Mr. Sparks made to her regarding the nature of Mr. Benjamin's mental health and his a forced ouster from oh, the her, school. His first testimony was so important. Why were you late in um, making the disclosure on that? A absolutely, Your Honor. The, the reason that those designations were made when they were is that 
the instructions on the submissions plaintiff understood them to be identify your in person witness bucket and your deposition witness bucket dr do it was in the in person witness bucket until she said that she would not testify in person and and regrettably that that only happened on july 12th yes so there had been that yes go ahead so are you saying you identified her as an in person witness on time Absolutely, Your Honor. Yes, she was on our list, and she was well known, obviously, to both the court and the defendants. She was the only person of five who was in that November 21 meeting who the jury did not hear from. And this was exploited by defendants in their closing, and I can talk about that in more detail. But what about the fact that, that dealing with designating her uh, deposition and any objections there, too, would have delayed the trial? Since, uh, I, if I'm correct, the um, designation of her as a deposition witness came pretty close to trial, didn't it? Well, Your Honor, the designations were made by plaintiffs 30 days in advance of trial. They were made on July 15th. The trial commenced August 15th. So not only did the parties have 30 days after those designations were first made, but defendants had already made deposition designations. They had already gone through this deposition. The deposition was known to them. And under, and I'm sure the court is, is familiar with the Southern States factors, as well as cases like Dougherty, um, a situation like this where the material was already in defendant's possession, and here not only was it in their possession, but they had already mined it for what they clearly thought was useful material. Um, it was a single-day deposition, and the parties had ample time to deal with um, any counter designations or anything that like that that was necessary indeed defendants had made designations of dr duick's testimony um, and the deadline for counter designations had only passed two days before plaintiffs made our own designations again the reason that we we had to change is that the witness's status changed she made it clear that she simply was not going to testify in person at that time and plaintiff promptly made deposition I mean, she, that she, she, she was his ex-wife is that right well she now is mr benjamin's ex-wife at the time of the um at the time of the incidents she was still married to mr benjamin but yes and, uh, and, she, and she the, said she wasn't, that's when she said she wouldn't testify was did she assert some privilege she did not know your honor she was mr benjamin's ex-wife by that time um, making her the only third party who was, you know, the only third party non-party um, who, who was available to testify as to those events. But she was not claiming privilege. She was fully deposed. Um, and that's where the designations were coming from, including with regard well, to what you said, yeah. you said she wouldn't testify at the trial. Then, 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 then could you not issue subpoenas or something? What, ah, what, yes. What, as far pardon me sorry as far as the reasons for that your honor uh, dr duick is located in winnipeg uh, manitoba He's so country. correct mm -hmm. all right correct and <clears throat> yes yeah, so so the parties knew about this witness and this witness was a crucial witness known to be so by by the court and all the parties throughout this was not a new witness being sprung on the defendants. This was not um, extremely voluminous testimony. This was not a new class of damages. Um, the cases that the district court and defendants relied upon, essentially all of them did it involve new witnesses, a new expert, a new expert report, new types of damages being sought and calculated, things of that nature. Dowdy, which I mentioned, is a case that makes it very clear that where a witness is of great importance. This is Dowdy versus Aquin, uh, where even where there's a failure to timely disclose, um, and here plaintiff offers a good faith explanation for that disclosure. Unfortunately, the witness's status changed. In our submissions, we had noted that if a witness's status changed, we respectfully asked for the, um, for the right to include deposition designations, and indeed when defendants included their designations, our response to those was that our understanding is that Dr. Duick would be testifying in person and therefore the designations at that time were not necessary. And how so, long after her status changed did you um, notify uh, opposing counsel in the court? 
Yes. So on July 12th, her status, she said that she was refusing to, to show up any, any longer. She wouldn't do it. And July 15th, we sent defendants, uh, we were exchanging red lines with regard to pretrial submissions, and we included Dr. Duick's designations in that red line. Why didn't you tell him on the 12th? Your Honor, uh, you know, hindsight is 2020. We we needed to make those designations, and so, you know, that we we thought that that was prompt under the court's order and under Federal Rule 26, uh, Rule of Civil Procedure 26. Designations are generally uh, under 26. The designations are generally due 30 days in advance of the trial, um, which we did meet. We thought that we were acting promptly and. You know, and within the spirit of the court's order, because again, the court had said, you make designations of people who you expect to testify at deposition. So that's what was done. Um, the the surprise we believe was non-existent because again, everyone knew that she was going to be a witness one way or another. Um, the ability to cure the surprise under Southern states was there 30 days in advance. There was no disruption of the trial um, certainly, if the parties had agreed, okay, fine, this is now a deposition witness, um, and again, two days beyond the counter-designation date, um, the importance of the evidence was extremely high, which under southern states can cut both ways, right? If you're on the eve of trial, the day before trial, introducing a new witness, and this is a very important witness, clearly there's prejudice to the party who is not introducing that, that testimony here, where we're 30 days in advance of trial, witness who was identified on every list had previously been deposed, everyone had a copy of the deposition. There was no prejudice to the party who had already designated testimony from this deposition. There was extreme prejudice against plaintiff, Your Honor, because, as I mentioned earlier, in defendant's closing statement, this is at 79.60 to 61, the defendants claimed that Dr. Duick had said things to Nicholas Sparks and board member Tracy Lorenzen that her deposition completely contradicted. Dr. Duick testified to playing along with what Mr. Sparks and Ms. Lorenzen were saying. She testified in, a, in other parts of her deposition to the fact that Mr. Benjamin was being fired clearly from his job. She mentioned that Mr. Sparks made comments about Mr. Benjamin's mental health, which were not solicited or affirmed by her. And this was, and the absence of her testimony was completely exploited by the defendants. Indeed, in that closing statement, defense counsel said, and I realize Dr. Dweck is, in, is not here, but she has spoken in this courtroom and proceeded to go through what Mr. Sparks and Ms. Lorenzen testified to and ended with, um, that passage saying, and she may even have to consider moving to where she can get medical care, that is for Mr. Benjamin. And that's what she said. So, so, there was so let me ask you, um, you know, at, at the hearing, you uh, or whoever was there argued essentially that this Rule 26 is fairly limited. You, you, you said it really just applied to the testimony a party expects uh, to present by deposition. And the trial judge says, she didn't see the basis. The trial just didn't see the basis for that uh, limiting principle here. How do you respond to that? Well, well, Your Honor, the that that's that that is what we based our understanding on. The idea that we did not until Doctor Duick. But I mean, is the fact that Rule Twenty Six A so limited? If you go in thinking that it is simply for a designation of a witness testimony that you expect to present by deposition. Uh, and so you did not expect to present her testimony by deposition until July the 12th. Well, that's, that's, that's correct, Your Honor. Um, you know, and, and we did, you know, we did make an effort to get our designations out there as soon as, as possible. And so again, at the end not... of the day, what we're talking about is abuse of discretion. Is that right? That is correct. That is the applicable standard here. And un that's a little and hot for you under, under the situation here, given, you know, when you weigh all of these factors, I mean, it, the appellate court could, could see it one way and maybe all of us might have done differently with a trial judge, but that's not enough to give you an abuse of discretion. Well, under the Southern States factors, 
Your Honor, it would be sufficient. Again, I would look to the Dowdy case where it says that that evidence should not be barred. And under Southern states, it bars, it makes it very clear that the factors all line up on the side of the ledger to allow this testimony by Dr. Duick. Again, the surprise element was not there. This was a witness who everyone knew was going to testify. How did the judge explain the denial of your request? Yes. So the judge said that he felt that his deadline in his order had not been met and that the designations were extremely prejudicial. That's at 6636. But defendants were not able to proffer at that time any plausible prejudice here. Again, they had made their designations already. Defendants now in their opposition tried to claim that there was uncertainty as to how they would have to prepare for this witness. But obviously, if this is a deposition witness, there isn't any cross-examination to be prepared. The court made its final decision on this issue the day before trial, which admittedly could leave the parties scrambling, particularly us, Your Honor, because we had to get on the phone immediately after the conference and make an appeal to Dr. Duick's counsel. She was speaking to us through counsel during this time and make an appeal to her to show up in person. That would have prejudiced the parties more than anything, Your Honor, in the sense that now we're going to have a live witness at trial and all the parties would have to prepare for that unexpectedly. So this was the only timeliness-related issue or anything like that in the lead-up to this trial. So under surprise, there was no surprise. There was ample ability to cure the surprise given the 30 days. There would have been no disruption to the trial whatsoever. And as it turned out, there wasn't, but for the defendant to take advantage of it. Oh, pardon me. You can go ahead and finish your thought. Appreciated. And given the importance of this evidence, the critical nature of this evidence, again, she's in the room. She is giving testimony that contradicts defendants on critical pieces of information here regarding termination and the disability discrimination piece. And the nondisclosing parties' explanation really did have to do with the fact that witness status changes at times. And therefore, that is why this met all of the southern states' factors with regard to admission and, yes, abuse of discretion given the importance of the witness and the fact that there's no cognizable prejudice here. And obviously, we feel this was something along with the admission of the vast amount of character and prior act evidence that poisoned the record and requires vacating the jury verdict. Very good. You've saved some rebuttal time. We did. Thank you. Mr. Pinto? Yes, Your Honor. And if it pleases the court, Rick Pinto along with Deborah Bowers representing the Epiphany School of Global Studies. Mr. Benjamin resigned his position as head of school at Epiphany. He signed a resignation letter. He later changed his mind. He sued Epiphany and Mr. Sparks. He lost on every issue put before a jury and won't accept that. And here we are. I'll point out initially that the court, in looking at all of the issues before the court, except for the summary judgment and motions to dismiss, has to look at the evidence in the light most favorable to the defendants. There is a mountain of evidence on each issue favorable to the defendants. I'll also point out before I get into the weeds of my argument that all of the issues on appeal, with the exception of the defamation claim, are mute if the court upholds the jury verdict that said that Mr. Benjamin voluntarily resigned. Because if he voluntarily resigned, there's no adverse employment action, and therefore none of the discrimination claims nor any of the breach of contract claims can proceed. And that question was 
that that specific question was put to the jury in the interrogatory and the jury found that he resigned? Yes, sir. That was the first that's the first issue. They found not only he resigned, but they found he resigned voluntarily. Or more to the point, they found that the plaintiffs did not prove that his resignation was involuntary. Um I want to talk for just a minute about this resignation meeting. Specifically, what's the verdict say? Uh, yeah, the verdict form. What did um, the jury find? The jury found that the plaintiff failed to uh, meet meet their burden of showing that the resignation was involuntary. Okay. Yeah. Uh, with regard to the resignation meeting, that meeting took place uh, at a time after several meetings with Mr. Benjamin uh, when he knew that his job was on the line because they had been talking to him about all of the issues that you read about in the briefs uh, and in the record. The meeting was over two hours. His wife was present, and they spent that meeting negotiating the terms of a voluntary uh, split with a set negotiating the terms of a severance package. Uh, the wording of the uh, resignation, I think, is important. You'll find that on page five of our brief, but Mr. Benjamin contends he only wrote what the people told them. Everybody else in that meeting said he voluntarily wrote this out himself. But what he says is, I resign my position as headmaster and CEO. I will share with you there was testimony at trial that no one called Mr. Benjamin CEO except Mr. Benjamin. He also said, I want to thank my faculty staff and student colleagues. There was evidence that no one but Mr. Benjamin referred to students as student colleagues. So there was uh, some information other than just say so that the uh, resignation was voluntary. Uh, more importantly, after Mr. Benjamin and, and Ms. Zuak left, uh, Mr. Benjamin wrote Tom Plissick, who was with the placement firm that had placed him in his job, and he told him on that same day, I have offered my resignation as headmaster and CEO, etc. He followed that by writing Mr. Sparks, Mr. Gray, and Ms. Lorenzen an email uh, saying that he would live by the spirit of the separation agreement. And he was glad that they came to an agreement yesterday that was satisfactory to all of us, including the $150,000 severance package. And finally, Ms. Duek the next day emailed Mr. Sparks and thanked him for his generosity in the separation agreement and severance package. So there's no question but that there was a uh, voluntary resignation. Uh, since we, uh, the court spent some time on Ms. Duick's deposition testimony, let me share the time frame because what Mr. Uh, Pearson shared with you is not exactly what the record reflects. Mm -hmm. Everyone knew Ms. Duick lived in Canada. Her deposition had been videotaped, videotaped and taken in 2018. In February of 2019, a case management order was entered, and in that case management order, Judge Shevard said, on July 1, your Rule 26 disclosures are due. Rule 26 uh, disclosures include deposition designations. Right. Uh, on that date, or within a day or two, uh, there was a telephone call or emails shared between Mr. Pearson and the attorney for Ms. Duek in which that attorney said, I can give you no guarantee that Ms. Duek will appear for that trial. So he was put on notice in February. There was some other discussion uh, between them at, at, at that time. And there was an offer on the part of the attorney that said, get back to me if you want to work these out. Mr. Pearson did not have any further contact until three days before the designations were due on June 27th. On that day, he called and told the lawyer, I, I need her here for trial in August. The lawyer said to Mr. Pearson, Ms. Duek prefers not to testify on that day. So before the designation, he was on notice that she was not going to testify. On July 1, Mr. Pearson does not make a deposition designation as is required. 
on July 2. And that, and that was the after. deadline? July 1 was the deadline? Yes, ma'am. July 1 yeah. was the deadline set in the case management order. On the okay. July 2, the next day, the lawyer in Canada emails Mr. Pearson and says, confirming our telephone conversation, my client is not inclined to participate voluntarily. So he knew on July 2 that Ms. Zueck was not going to come down voluntarily. Mr. Benjamin Being never terrible filed. Being knew on July 2, but he knew back in February. He, exactly right. He knew there was no guarantee. That was the wording right. of that email. Uh, Mr. Benjamin never filed a motion to allow a video uh, testimony, never filed a motion for an expedited hearing on an effort to get their they're in, and he never filed a motion to amend his Rule 26 designation. What he did do after the July 12 conversation, when the lawyer confirmed that she is not coming, uh, the parties had been uh, exchanging draft pretrial orders. On July 25, uh, Mr. Pearson sent to defense counsel an updated draft of his pretrial order. With that email, he outlined every change to the prior pretrial order, except he didn't say anything about the deposition designations that he had slipped in as a portion of that latest draft. So that's the timeline. On July 31, he comes to the court and he says he wants to use the depositions the defendants object. Uh, and the court rules under Rule 26, under the case management order, and under Rule 37, importantly, and looking at the Southern state standards that uh, he determined that it was that the delay was not substantially justified. And he said that, uh, the, all the quotes are in our briefs, but he said, obviously you knew she wasn't gonna come. Obviously you knew it would be difficult to have a video conference from trial even and you didn't even make a motion about that or contact defense about that it is just difficult for the court to believe that you shouldn't have known she wasn't coming and you should have designated them uh, with regard to the do not expect issue the court just said i've never heard that before in my 45 years from the time i've practiced and been on the bench if that was the standard, then nobody would expect it and everybody would be surprised at the end. And Judge Wynn makes a, a, an important point in the Bresler case when he says, if this testimony is so important to the plaintiffs, then it is even more important to disclose timely that information to the defendants because they need that time to prepare. And as far as our prejudice, uh, remember we are under a 14 hour deadline we had spent a lot of time figuring out who was going to say what. We have three defendants and two lawyers sharing 14 hours. Well, uh, I, I am I'm surprised by both the parties, and of course you have to respond, so much time is being spent on this issue in this case. Maybe I'm misreading it, but I, I just did not see this issue as being <laughs> that, that we would spend all this time on Particularly when I, I understand, I expect the judge totally. It, it, I think it's enough to support him. I, I don't know about the obviousness of it when you're dealing with an ex-wife. I'm sure there was a lot of other expectations of what might happen, what could happen. But the end result is when you read this thing just as uh, technically as what it is, it, 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 it lays down on all fours on it. But let me ask you just as a matter of practice, because this is really more of an exercise in civil procedure, so the thing I maybe there'd be a bar exam question on one of my interns are listening mm -hmm. uh, but you know uh if if uh if a, if a court has already issued a, a case management order has a deadline what happens if uh what can a person do if, if he then discovers uh that he that he you know he needs to uh to use his deposition testimony instead i mean what is there any remedy that he has at that point if he truly discovered it after the fact which is not the case here he can move to uh, amend his disclosures, set forth the reasons, and if the court feels it's substantially justified, the court can allow it. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I can have, I, I agree, Judge Wynn, and if I can have uh, two minutes here, and if I go over slightly, uh, Mr. Silver has graciously said I could angle into his time a little bit, I will touch on the two other aspects that uh, I think the court may be interested in. With regard to the after-acquired evidence, 
of the jobs at Verde Valley and Deep Springs. I will say that those were, uh, the court determined that those were relevant to contract defenses after acquired evidence. The evidence was that if the Board of Trustees had known about that information, they would not have hired Mr. Benjamin, and if they had learned it after the hire, they would have fired him for cause. Uh, the court was very clear that uh, that was the only basis that that information was coming to the jury. They instructed the jury four times that it was being admitted not for its truth, but to show the state of mind of the Board of Trustees if they had known. Uh, the standard is whether it was arbitrary or irrational, and this court has indicated that, it, that a verdict will not be overturned on those grounds except under the most extraordinary circumstances. I'll point out that Judge Dever did not allow all of that deposition testimony in. Much of what we wanted to uh, have come in for the jury, he excluded. And many of the documents we wanted to have come in for the jury, he excluded. So it was very limited. And he also instructed the jury that opening statements, closing arguments, and questions are not evidence. So any comments about that information was addressed there. And finally, with regard to the breach of contract claim and the jury instruction, I'll briefly point out that this court's pretty clear. You can't just take one line and say that line misrepresents the law. You have to look at the entire charge. And in fact, you have to look at the entire record. And all of the record of this case shows that the evidence points to resignation. Uh, the issue number two uh, turns it on its fact. If a jury determined that the resignation was involuntary, the next issue talks all about uh, termination and talks all about the defendant's duty to prove that the termination was for cause. So it's cured if there was an error, which we don't believe there was, but it's cured by the rest of the charge. Um, and the examples from Stone that give examples that if you're faced with two choices and both of them are bad, that still means you have a choice and it's still a voluntary uh, decision. Those weren't facts taken from the Benjamin case. Those were facts taken from the Stone case. So the charge was taken directly from that case and correctly outlined the law. Thank you, Arnie. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Silver. May it please the court. I'm Jay Silver. I represent Nicholas Sparks. I represent the Nicholas Sparks Foundation. I will be brief. Judge King, to your uh, question earlier, I just want to be very clear. The verdict form as to the resignation read, did plaintiff Saul Hillel Benjamin prove by preponderance of the evidence that his resignation from defendant, the Epiphany School of Global Studi Studies was involuntary? And to that, the jury answered no. They answered this similarly to a similarly worded, almost identically worded verdict, answered no with respect to the foundation. Because I represent Mr. Sparks and the foundation, I first want to address points that are specific to each of them. Let me talk about the resignation from the foundation first. Specifically, I disagree with that uh, Mr. Pearson's view that there was a lack of evidence even sufficient to support a resignation instruction with respect to the foundation going to the jury. And no, I do not believe that he adequately preserved that. And his briefing on this issue, it certainly wasn't brief that way in his opening brief. And furthermore, when you look at the record, and specifically his own factual contention in the pretrial order states, Mr. Benjamin, Benjamin had no intention of resigning from Epiphany and the foundation and only did so because he was under duress. And similarly, at another point in the pretrial proceedings, he said, Mr. Benjamin must prove by preponderance of the evidence that the cessation of Mr. Benjamin's contracts and employments would not voluntary on the part of Mr. Benjamin. Those are plaintiff's words, not our words. The evidence in this case was that Mr. Sparks walked into the November 21 terminate, uh, resignation meeting. He did tell Mr. Benjamin his contract as an independent contractor with the uh, foundation was being terminated for dishonesty. Then Dr. Duick and Mr. Benjamin negotiated a resignation and severance from the foundation, I mean, excuse me, from the school. Later that night, 
Mr. Benjamin now, the lady, sent a, the, the lady you, re, you referred to as Dr. Zuick, that's his wife at the time. That is his wife, Jenna. Yes, sir. All right. So they negotiate a resignation from the school. He writes a, an email that night to this recruiter who recruited him to Epiphany. He tells the recruiter, I resigned. He sends an email the next day to Nicholas saying to Mr. Sparks, I've resigned. <clears throat> His wife, then, who is also, by the way, a vice president of the foundation, comes to another school board member and another volunteer of the foundation the next day and says, would you agree, or would you ask Nicholas Sparks on behalf of the foundation to agree that Mr. Benjamin, that saw my husband, be allowed to resign from the foundation? They said yes, and they sent a confirming letter to that effect a few days later, to which Mr. Benjamin never responded. So there is evidence, and the jury found that, no, he did resign, and that that was more than adequate, I think, to support the jury's verdict. Let me move on for just briefly to talk about the defamation issue, as, and specifically, plaintiffs challenged the inadequacy of the instruction and claimed basically that under North Carolina law, you're not permitted, uh, you should be permitted some latitude in what the statement is in a slander case that's submitted to the jury. That's not North Carolina law. That totally circumvents in a slander or defamation context, the First Amendment and uh, <clears throat> slander per quote, if you will, or slander per se requirements that a judge serves as a gatekeeper. In other words, before a statement can go to the jury, a judge has to decide, is it a matter of a statement of opinion or fact? That's required under the First Amendment. And secondly, he or she has to decide, and is this a statement that's susceptible of only one meaning so that it's truly slander per se? And if you were to adopt plaintiff's reading, which by the way, again, has no legal support, well then, all you could do is really then you're guessing as to what, as a gatekeeper, as what's going to go to the jury. The only case I do cite against it for that is a case decided by Judge Britt in North Carolina, but applying Texas law that in which the North Carolina libel claim was dismissed. I then want to close out briefly on this Jenna Duick issue and just briefly state that no, it was not adequately disclosed. Judge Dever went through this in painstaking detail in making a finding to exclude her testimony. And as we know, simply designating depositions in this context, we are on a runway to trial. We had to make counter designations. We had to make objections. And at the same time, they sat on this for weeks before they disclosed it. And merely slip sheeting it into a without disclosure uh, on July 15th, but not really calling it to our attention. And for several weeks later, that doesn't count. Judge Dever said he'd assume that was in good faith. I don't think it is, but again, the entirety of the order and circumstances is the judge properly excluded that. I thank you. That's all I have to say right now. Thank you, Mr. Silver. Mr. Pearson? You yes, Your Honor. Your bottle time. Thank you. First, very briefly on the defamation point, the North Carolina pattern instructions do not provide quotations in the instruction with regard to defamation. They simply ask, did the defendant slander the plaintiff? The inclusion of the quotations here were extremely problematic because they were not just exact quotations, but they contain compound statements saying, asking whether Mr. Benjamin had proven that Mr. Sparks had said that he, quote, had dementia and bipolar disorder, quote, and that bipolar disease runs in his family. And the other instruction as well contained compound questions. When parts of these statements would be defamation, Mr. Sparks himself testified that he may have um, sit, talked with the board about Mr. Benjamin suffering from mental health issues. Uh, Ms. Lorenzen did the same, said that in discussions with the board, the words dementia and Alzheimer's had been discussed. The plaintiffs are not required to prove a verbatim statement that they allege in their complaint. Plaintiffs are required to prove the elements that Mr. Silver laid out, defamation, that 
and here that Mr. Sparks made statements regarding Mr. Benjamin's mental health and its relation to his professional competence and ability to hold a job. And Renee Coles testified to classic defamation um, in her testimony, talking about how Nicholas Sparks told her that Mr. Benjamin, quote, had dementia and bipolar and would probably never work again. And he had to be let go. It had to happen. And that bipolar ran in Mr. Benjamin's family. That's at 7448. That is not the exact statement that, in, that is in, in the verdict form, but it is the same. It does match it in substance. The jury heard a few different versions of these statements. Again, Mr. Mr. Sparks himself testified that he may have told members of the school community that Mr. Benjamin was acting quote unquote crazy. Um, and, you know, and, and that's at 70, 21 to 22, but he couldn't recall exactly what he'd said. So, you know, that and along with Ms. Ms. Uh, Lorenzen's testimony at 73, 51 to 52 and 73, 94 to 96 shows that these statements, again, there was more than enough evidence out there to show that there were defamatory statements made by Mr. Sparks regarding Mr. Benjamin, but to hold the plaintiff to exact quotations, the jury can easily be misled that those precise statements and all of the statements made in those instructions needed to be proven. Now, turning back to the briefly to the duet testimony issue, I would also urge the court to look at the Silicon Knights um, Epic Games opinion. That's an Eastern District of North Carolina 2012 opinion, where an untimely disclosure that was admittedly important to plaintiff's case factors will often favor the plaintiff in allowing admission. Well, was there anything inaccurate in what opposing, the manner in which opposing counsel recited the timeline and what happened here? Yes, there are things that I would dispute, Your Honor. First of all, the conversation that I had with Dr. Duke's attorney in late June, they said that she would come to the, to the trial. The day after we make our July 1st uh, you know, submission, they call back and say, you know, they, they write the email, and we've all had opposing counsel who are somewhat more bold and emailed on the phone saying, no, you know what, sure, you know, she, she would rather not have to do it if she doesn't have to, and yes, you know, that, that's, that's not something that we're going to commit to. We had more conversations, and our expectation remained that she would come. That's all that Rule 26 says at, um, uh, at 26A, 3A, sub 2. Designation of witnesses where testimony the party expects to present that by deposition. Yes, if we, if we knew now what we, you know, then what we know now, you know, obviously we would have done things differently. Our expectation was she is on this side of the ledger, the in-person side of the, of the ledger. We're dealing here with Mr. Pinto, Mr. Silver, and their teams with very experienced trial counsel. They'd already designated testimony by Dr. Duick. The counter designations deadline had passed two days before we made these designations. And again, under Southern states, Dowdy, Silicon Knights, this can, yes, indeed, be a, an abuse of discretion. Um, the, uh, the red line that was sent it was sent in red line. This was not put in, you know, some you know, document with saying, okay, great, everything is terrific, ready to go. This was a red line submission. And did you, did you highlight that there was uh, that there was that um, change in the um, deposition submissions, like you did other other items in that document. I have not looked back at the covering email. I don't know whether every other change was accounted for in that covering email, but for that, that one, change was not accounted for. I don't. I don't believe it was. I don't. But I, it probably. If defense counsel is making that represent, representation, then it, it probably was not. I will. Say, I will say that again. This was 30 days before trial. This was a known witness. Um, the deposition testimony was not hugely voluminous and the defendants took full advantage of this at trial, which is exactly why under the case law, when you have important testimony, the factors favor it coming in so long as there is no 
significant disruption at trial, and defendants still can't point to any. With regard to the testimony by, by Newell and Salzman at trial, the testimony by previous employers, this is a, a hugely important point because it really poisoned the entire proceeding. It, the testimony by those witnesses had a palpable, visible effect on the jury. And the defendant's closing statement, this is at 7858, showed that they knew exactly why they were introducing this. This had nothing to do with the after-acquired evidence defense. That defense had to do with alleged disputed um, discrepancies in whether or not Mr. Benjamin had identified an employer from 1990, where he was at six months on his resume, um, as well as the dates of some of his other employment back in the 1990s. For that, you do not need 239 pages, and that's how much trial testimony was read, um, presented by, by video uh, deposition at, at trial by these two witnesses to establish the dates of employment, because that was the supposed misconduct or misrepresentation that served as the basis for that defense. Instead, what you got was Newell talking about how Mr. Benjamin had supposedly given him a falsified resume back in 1989 or, or, or 1990. And that piece of testimony, I can tell you firsthand, had a visible effect on the jury and had nothing to do well, the, with well, anything Mr. Benjamin had said. Well, the court gave limiting instructions on that. Yes, and I'm glad the, the court brought that up because I wanted to address that as well. Well, I, the think, limiting you, I think I heard your bell, but I'm not sure. Oh, could, could we address this one last yeah. point? Yeah, we heard, Thank I you heard for, the bell, too, but you answered Judge Sackett's question. Long thank you very – we'll we'll do, Your Honor. The limiting instruction was, in fact – and this was in the jury instructions as well – was confusing and futile. The material, of course, was in there for the truth of the matter. Otherwise, it wouldn't serve as the basis for an after-acquired evidence defense. Unless, the material, unless what you're hearing is true, that this happened at prior employers, which again is not a pro – again, it had nothing to do with this material. It was about performance and disputes and other things, not about dates of employment. Unless it was true, it wouldn't serve as the basis. State of mind has nothing to do with it. The state of mind of Newell or Salzman or, frankly, the board has no connection to disparaging Mr. Benjamin's performance at employers he was at 20 and 30 years ago. So that part of the instruction was of no Thank avail. You my question. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pearson. We, we appreciate Thank you. your arguments and that of the counsel on the other side. Uh, this case will be submitted for decision. And Madam Clerk, we'll take a brief break uh, and then call the next case. Thank you, Judge. The court will take a brief break, brief, brief break before hearing the next case. Uh, I'll be ending the conference and calling all of the judges back. And
The Honorable, the Judges of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Our next case is number 1967-74, Krimble v. United States of America. Uh, Mr. Berger, representing the plaintiff. Are you there, Mr. Berger? I am, Your Honor. I'd be pleased to hear from you, sir. Thank Mr. you, Edward. sir. Well, thank you very much, and sorry we all have to meet this way. Um, and I, if, if any of y'all have a problem hearing me, just let me know. Um, may it please the court, my name is Bruce Berger. I'm an attorney here in Raleigh, and along with Jim Craven, who's in the room with me, uh, represent the estate of Michael Krimble, uh, who is both the plaintiff and the appellant. Uh, I know you all have read the briefs, and I'm not going to belabor the facts, but I, I do think there's a few pertinent facts that we'd like to uh, review. Because of a squamous cell carcinoma in his scalp, Mr. Kremble was transferred to Butner in June of 2013. He was evaluated by a dermatologist in July, on July 8th of 2013, who recommended immediate uh, meaning within the month, according to his note, uh, surgery for the carcinoma. Uh, that was immediately approved by the review board at Butner, and, but nothing happened at all um, with regard to Dr. Katz's recommendations until October 15th when Mr. Kremble saw a second uh, surgeon who had also immediately recommended surgery. And unfortunately, again, um, nothing happened with regard to that surgery for a couple of months. Uh, it's very important to note that uh, during this time, from July to October and then from October to December, Mr. Kremble remained at Butner. He was seen in the medical clinic literally every day, having his scalp wound um, treated, meaning cleaned out at that point because there really was no treatment. Um, Finally, uh, by the time he got back to Duke in December of 2013, um, he was no longer a surgical candidate for the relatively benign um, called MOHS, M-O-H-S, surgery that they had recommended because the cancer had spread, had gotten deeper, which resulted in an extremely uh, longer, much more severe um, course for Mr. Kremble, and I'll, I'll mention that in just a few minutes. Um, the important point of reviewing that is that this case from our standpoint, and we believe is clear from the pleadings, uh, is a, about a delay in getting necessary treatment. Initially between July 8th and October, and then between October and the remainder of, of the year. But and as I understand the facts, even as you recite them, um, the BOP did what they were supposed to do and what they could do under their contract. Well, Judge, that's the, that is exactly, I think, what the problem is that we have with both the district court's uh, opinion and the, and the government's position is we disagree with that. They didn't do what they were supposed to do which was not to schedule him for treatment, but to get him treatment. And that's what didn't happen. So what, what is it that um, the BOP should have done and how could they have done it um, given the contract that they have with the other entity? Well, the BOP uh, was literally in daily contact with Mr. Kremble, who was at their facility they saw him every day. They knew of the orders from both of the doctors that he needed the immediate tr treatment. They knew literally on a daily basis after that first 30 days that that had not happened. And they took no action to look into why he wasn't getting the treatment to actually make sure he got the treatment. So we believe, although the University of Massachusetts, which of course nobody really knew about, may have not scheduled it, the BOP had the duty to have him treated, not just scheduled for care. And that's where they dropped was, the ball. Well, was, well the, the University of Massachusetts had a person 
on the scene at Butler, did it not? Who was called the scheduler? As, as I understand it, the, the scheduler was it was in Massachusetts. Although, um, to be honest with you, I don't know where the scheduler was. But okay. Judge, well, I certainly don't either. But it, well, well it, uh, I'm sorry. I, I was from reading some of the papers. I, I was under the impression they, the scheduler was there at Butner, but. Yeah, I was but, too. Let, 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 let me let me add further though. I, I think this really gets to the crux of the issue though. Um, if you know, as scheduling is one component of it, and this would have been a different situation, for example, if Mr. Kremble had been, you know, someplace else, a call didn't take place, and and he had some option of of you know, had he disappeared from the facility, had he been released. Um, and it wasn't scheduled, that would be one thing. But he was at the facility literally going to the clinic every single day. So I think that well, the, the think blunt... all, We understand yeah. all that, but, but the Bureau of Prisons had contracted with the University of Massachusetts medical people to provide these services to the, the, the services that we're talking about here, these types of services, uh, at Butner. And the University of Massachusetts was an independent contractor. Uh, well, the, the, they were supervised the, by the people at, at Butner. Well, what the Mass University of Massachusetts did was not schedule him, but but the but Butner, who held Mr. Crimble, never took care of getting him the actual treatment. They never looked back into the question. I mean, he was there at oh. Butner. Well, what about the the declaration that we have in the record from the BOP that says that the contract between the BOP and UMass does not require um, follow up, which is you know follow up to I guess make sure that UMass did what they're supposed to do. Um, what are we to do with that? Well, I think one of the problems is that uh, first of all, I think under federal law under the statute. The BOP had the duty, not just to schedule him for care, but to get him the care. Number one, and secondly, the the contract that you know uh, Butner had policies which are in the record that required reevaluation continuously of Mr. Kremble and, and other people seeking medical care, and so Butner's own policies say that they had to continue to reevaluate the patient and get him the care that he needed. So even if even if UMass dropped the ball in not scheduling that appointment, the day-to-day -day ongoing continuous uh, relationship between Kremble and Butner, who had the legal duty to make sure not just that the care was scheduled, but he actually got the care, is where they we, we believe were negligent. So let me. Well, I, I want to ask you a question regarding the the duty of the care that you are alluding to here. And, and I need you to carefully differentiate this for me. What are we talking about here? We're talking about, are we talking about a medical malpractice type action or the medical standard of care? Are we talking about a common law standard? What is yeah, the duty that you ascribe to the defendants in this case? Yeah, Judge, that, that's a great question. No, so it's very clearly we are not talking about medical malpractice. What we're talking about is a, a violation of 18 U.S.C. 4042, which says that the BOP shall provide suitable quarters and provide for the safekeeping care and, and subsistence of all persons charged with or convicted of offenses. So we're talking about a common law duty of negligence, negligence, I mean, a duty, breach of duty, and damages ultimately under North Carolina law, but created by the federal statute. So you are saying that the presence of Butler having a medical facility, none of that duty arises from the doctors or the medical people there failing to do something. You are, you are tying this on the statutory duty that, that falls on the correction center as a whole. Yes, that's that's correct, Your Honor. And I will point out that we actually have no, we are not critical of the doctors at all. It's not because we think that he was ordered to have the care that he needed. 
but that Butner mechanically, logistically failed to make that happen. The, the doctors recognized the problem, they diagnosed it timely, they ordered the appropriate care, and the ball was dropped by Butner in getting that done. And that's it. We believe that, it, just as you say, that that's a breach of the common law duty based upon that statute. Wait, wait, wait a minute now. I want to make sure. You said common law duty based upon that statute. I'll break that down for me a little bit. Is it based upon the duty created by statute or is it a common law duty? Well, the, uh, the statute says that the government's to provide the care for the prisoners, but the, the negligence, whether or not they breach that care, I think is, is a common law. So it arises from the statute, but it's analyzed on the basis of common law negligence and, and not medical malpractice. So, so uh, what are you talking about a reasonable care under the circumstances under that statute? Uh, uh, yes, sir. That, yes. That, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that, that's but, precisely. But, but I'm, I'm just trying to follow through because I think it relates to the other question. And that is the question of what 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 uh, did it need to actually ensure that he get the surgery or just follow the schedule? I, I'm, that, that, that's kind of the conundrum here. Yeah. Well. I think that he needed to get the surgery as recommended by the doctors who saw him on two different occasions, and that's where they that's where they failed. Um, n not just kind of whenever, but they specifically said when it needed to happen. He was in their care. He was he was a captive audience. They knew of the care, and they never al never allowed that to happen. And that's what we believe the negligence was. Um, which we believe is created but, or, or is established in part by a violation of their own policies. And then, where, and where do you get the waiver of the uh, sovereign immunity under the Federal Tort Claims Act? How do you get this under the Federal Tort Claims Act? Well, the, under the Federal they Tort say, Claims, go ahead. I'm sorry. They say they they say they made a contract with the University of Massachusetts, an independent contractor who provide these services. That's what the United States of America is saying. And of course, uh, he's going to stand up there and explain it better than I can, or that's what I well, read anyway. Well, and you didn't bring a, you don't bring an Eighth Amendment claim. We, we do not. We think it's a Federal Tort Claims uh, for, for simple negligence, not an Eighth Amendment claim for deliberate indifference. I agree with that. But that Tort, and, claims, Act, that tort claims Act is strictly construed. It's a waiver of sovereign immunity, and it's limited to what, what's in the act. I completely agree with that, Judge, and, and where we disagree with the government on this position in the district court is that it is the, it was, when, when the University of Massachusetts did not schedule Mr. Kremble, that was one thing, and they may be negligent, but it's Butner's negligence, their independent negligence in not getting him needed but, care. So you're saying that you're saying that Butner should have controlled what University of Massachusetts did in performing their contractual obligations. No, sir. That, actually, that runs that runs dead in, head on into what an independent contractor is. No, um, what we are. You don't have an independent contractor relationship. If there's a control of the so-called independent contractor, then they're an employee. You know, Judge, that's really not what we're saying. What we're saying is that this guy was housed at Butner, and when this, what the ordered care uh, because of a, a dropping, a, a, you know, scheduling problem didn't occur that every single day at Butner, Butner had the opportunity and the obligation to go back and say, what's going on here? Why hasn't he gotten the care? This hasn't happened. You know, th they had that obligation ongoing by their own policy. But, but that, what you just described, uh, you know, the obligation you're saying they have to, to go back and say, what's going on here? Why hasn't this happened? What you just described is requiring the BOP to exercise day-to-day -day control over their independent contractor, which, as Judge King says, recognizes, is at odds with what an independent contractor relationship is. That's you know, the I don't problem we have, or I have. 
they can't contract out of their statutory responsibility. Yeah, I, I think that they have the ongoing responsibility, and we are to go back to uh, Massachusetts, to go back to somebody and say, this guy was ordered to get care, and he it hasn't happened. I mean, they can... And where do you find support for that ongoing responsibility? Well, one, the statute. The, uh, the, that says that it's the it's it's the government that has it, and secondly, in their policies, which are in the which are in the record, that say that the government has the duty not just to schedule care, but to actually ensure that the care happens. So I think that their own policies provide. Uh, may I just finish this answer? You sure can. You go right ahead. Thank you. I think their own policies provide. Um, that they have the duty to get the guy the care he needs. They can do it through contract, but the duty ultimately is theirs. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Uh, let's see, we're now going to hear from the government. Uh, Mr. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, may it please the court. I am Rudy Renfer with the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of North Carolina. And I represent the United States in this matter. Good to have uh, you here, sir. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here, even though it's only telephonically. Yes, sir. Um, in this case, um, you know, the, the ultimate question being, did BOP owe a duty to ensure that Mr. Krimble obtained necessary medical care for a terminal illness? Um, the short answer is no. They did not owe a duty outside of uh, 28 United States Code 4042. That well, duty is one of reason. Your Mr. Berger says that's enough, doesn't he? That he's in your custody, and you're uh, he's over at Butner, and you all are supposed to take care of him. Yes, sir. But what Mr. Berger's position? Uh, uh, the, we're all appeal to me. Mm -hmm. Well, what it, I think that position um, tends to ignore Supreme Court decisions uh, back in the early '70s that specifically recognized that agencies like BOP. Um, our BOP uh, has the authority to contract out some of the care that's required under 4042. So by, by, actually, by actually contracting for specialty medical care and the, the scheduling of specialty med medical care, they are fulfilling their obligation under 4042 to ensure that the inmates get the appropriate medical care because sometimes medical care can be simple in the form of a cold, or a sprained ankle, but oftentimes, especially with BOP, when you have inmates uh, who tend to serve longer sentences than they do uh, in the state prisons, they, uh, they'll develop health problems which become more complicated and will require the services and scheduling of specialty providers that BOP simply does not have at Butner. And in order to ensure these patients get the care they need, they you enter into us that, that this contract that you all made with University of Massachusetts was pursuant to the statute that he cites? What I'm cites? saying is, Your Honor, what I'm saying is that under 4042, they're supposed to provide the basic necessities and that Congress allows BOP to contract, uh, to contract out some of those uh, services that provide the necessities. And that's precisely what they did in this case. And, is, and, and they made a contract with the University of Massachusetts. Correct, and they use their discretion. That's what, that's what you're dependent on here. But why did well, you keep the contract secret? That's what kind of bothers me. Mm -hmm. You kept the contract secret. How would anybody, how would Mr. Krimble have known this? Or how would uh, anybody represent him on it if you got the contract secret? Well, I've all been farmed out to Massachusetts. Well, I, I don't think the contract was secret. I mean, it, it, it wasn't. It wasn't something that they actively in the field, did from in the field. Uh, I think it was uh, briefly in district court, but then upon uh, further discussion with BOP counsel, uh, we decided it really didn't need to be sealed. Uh, well, that could be, and they can, quite frankly, that could be another case. But it is sealed in this case. But it's not. It's, it's not sealed. something. I, 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 gonna, I was on the first. It's sealed in this case. Yes. Yes, sir. I, I was just saying. I think I misspoke just then. Um, okay. So. But no, it's not. It's not that it was. It was not that it was. That, why is it sealed? I mean, the 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 the, the, the prisoners, like Mr. Trimble and those 
uh, uh, similar to him, and any institution should know that if, if, if the Bureau of Prisons has farmed out their obligations to provide medical services to some private uh, hospital, who they going to complain to? Right. Well, okay. So if you take take this case as an example, um, Mr. Krimble, um, there was never a FOIA request. There was never a FOIA request. There was never any type of administrative remedy seeking that information. And quite frankly, if Mr. Krimble uh, was seen, suffering from, this man is suffering from cancer and waiting on a, a surgery, and you're saying he should make a FOIA request? No, Your Honor. I'm, I'm saying I'm not, I'm not saying that's a recommended course of action. But I'm saying there are methods out there of doing it. And one of the things that I was about to say was that, you know, if he's seeing these medical professionals at BOP every day, I don't think he's established that he even sought information about who was scheduling. I mean, quite frankly, you know, practically speaking, all it takes perhaps is a few questions of the folks that he sees there to say, hey, who is doing the scheduling for this? Because I haven't seen, I haven't been seeing uh, somebody. And they'll say, oh, that's you, Matt. So are you but okay? he's, he's, here's a concern I have. And um, appreciate the work you're doing on this, and it, it's an interesting situation because one of the situations that arises here is is uh, he's in custody. He does not have freedom of movement. He can't do anything. And while you can develop a contract for medical care, the contract does not contract away the duty or the custodial duty that you have to, to keep it. So he, he is limited as to what he can do because he's in prison. Um, and, and given the fact of that, the, the, the question then becomes, is this a different case than someone who is maybe going to a regular medical facility and they say, well, we contract that part of our, our care away and you need to check back with us and keep checking with us. And, you know, with, 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 without direct contact of the, of the of the independent contractor that's what judge king's getting to is if does he have pretty or is he does he have any connection with the independent contractor to to get that message to him and and even if even if he does they have him in custody and and if i understand this injury and what it has got i tell you it sounded very horrific um uh because it, i understand it was smelling and had all kinds of things going with it and and uh, and, and this is on his head it's, it's a horrible situation, and, and I'm trying to – what do you think? Do you, don't you think there's a different level of duty if you have someone in custody and you control their every motion and, they, and, and not independent contractors? No, Your Honor, the duty arises under 4042, and the standard for that duty is one of reasonableness and diligence. Now, I think – what what appears to me that some of the um, some of the issues surrounding this case but, but are, let, me, let me let me let me make sure we're interpreting that and, and I think you're right it does say reasonable care under the circumstances I'm addressing the circumstances and here are yes, the circumstances see. so we, we we're talking about a prison <laughs> that that's that's what we have we have that's what I want you to go to <laughs> okay so in the circumstances involving a prison um, as far the independent contractor exception. Uh, in, the, in taking this case as an example, uh, assuming that you know, the, and not, not no reason to question opposing counsel's uh, 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 representation that you know about the independent contractor until relatively recently. Uh, in this case, they filed uh, the tort claim, the SF95. They exhausted the remedies. They filed the lawsuit, and then when the first motion to, to dismiss gets filed three years ago. They're informed of the independent contractor at that point. But uh, as far as I can tell, no steps were taken to, uh, under, to, to pursue that line of discovery and to try to pursue the independent contractor for negligence. They've had the opportunity for three years now. And they've just, they're resting all their laurels on the fact that because he was in BOP custody, BOP must be at fault. And that is contrary. Of, of negligence by both parties. I mean, wouldn't the government have the same option uh, under the Federal Tort Claims Act to uh, seek uh, contribution or indemnity from the uh, from the University of Massachusetts? But I, if if under the law BOP would remain uh, liable uh, for uh, negligence of an independent contractor, 
But under the Tort Claims Act, the United States can only be liable for the negligence of its employees. And in this case, there's been no showing that a BOP was negligent, BOP employee was negligent in any manner, shape, or form. You and know, the evidence think is, about it in a, in a common sense. If you've got a guy in prison and, and they say you've got to have surgery to remove this very aggressive cancer, skin cancer that's developing, and you need it right now, you got a doctor says now, and, and yet it's five minutes, months later, and this thing is festering and all kinds of stuff on it, and he's in prison. Uh, and it's the, it's the button of federal medical center. It's not just any type of ailment you got here. It's just... It just doesn't sound right. I, I follow the way to the law in terms of the independent contractor and doing that, but there are certain things, if you have control of an individual, the question is to what extent can you point the finger at the third, at somebody else says it's his fault. You know, University of Massachusetts. By the way, I don't know why it's in Massachusetts. Yeah. I understand the government works. They probably give contracts and stuff, but you got two medical center right up the road. It makes no sense to me or, or UNC, but, yeah. but we'll leave that aside. You don't have to go there. You probably feel the same way. But, uh, but it, well, it, as, as, as a state, as a state fan, I can see why they went into Duke or Carolina, but that's just me. Uh, I got you. But, uh, but my, my point being here is that, you know, it, it is an aggressive cancer, and he's in prison. And, uh, you know, to the extent of what he can do, and Lord knows we see enough cases here where prisoners that try to do all kinds of stuff. That that's typically not treated so very kindly. Not even at Butler. And I know Butler's a, you know, seems to me be a better facility from what I've seen. But uh, this is a pretty aggressive thing. And I'm I, I just don't know. I don't, is this is something you should be able to just turn and say, Oh, that's that's their fault. He's been sitting here for five months. We've been looking at him every day. We see what's going on here. And the man is, I mean, obviously he's got, got something going on. He, he didn't just sit there silently for five months. You can't. With this kind of cancer, I can't imagine. The, the inmates of this, everybody's got to see what's going on with this man. they got to be asking him every day what's going on. By the way, he's going to die because this is, this, is, this is serious stuff. And yet nothing is done. Well, Your Honor, I, uh, one one issue about the facts that I, I want to try to clear up uh, from the United States point of view is, um, you know, Dr. Katz had his recommendation that the uh, most surgery be scheduled as soon as possible, and that was in July of 2013. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, it's undisputed, it's undisputed that the BOP uh, approved that uh, request, you know, pretty quickly and forwarded that to the UMass scheduler. What was that? Now, was that what they were waiting for the plastic surgeon? Okay, well, see, that's that's what I want to get to is that when they went when when they scheduled it in October, and Dr. Cook, who was also an independent, Dr. Katz in July was an independent contractor. When it, when the appointment, the follow up appointment that Dr. Katz recommended was scheduled, and it was scheduled for October, when Dr. Cook saw Mr. Krimble, there was no notation that it was too late for Mo's surgery. What he said was, he he was scheduled for the Mo's surgery in October, but it was Dr. Cook, the independent contractor, who said. I know you're here for most surgery, but I really need to take a. I need to consult with a plastic surgeon first. By the way, okay. he is, he he is, he died. At, I heard heard them say his state. I'm not sure I saw that in the record. Is he he, he died. Since, died. The, since the appeal, okay. yeah, since sorry. the appeal, he passed away. I, I but so that. so in October, Dr. Cook um, indicated that there was no indication that it was too late for most surgery, but it was only from the period. And so when he recommended the consult with the plastic surgeon. BOP, once again, it's undisputed. They approved that r really quickly and forwarded that to UMass just like they were supposed to. And that, that, that's not in dispute here. And then it was that five-week time from the end of October to the beginning of December that things really went downhill for the cancer. And it was that five-week period. And so essentially, uh, Mr. Krimble's case is that during that five-week period, the BOP didn't ensure that I got my most surgery done. Because going back, and I hate to repeat myself, from July to October, there's kind of been a presumption that things went downhill for Mr. Krimble during that point. But if you look at the, the, the record in this case and the undisputed evidence, Dr. Cook never made that kind of representation. He you flat know, out the, said, only thing, the only thing I want to just make, it just seems obvious to me, if this man wasn't in prison and he was out in the ordinary area and had a doctor in the, in the record, he, he, he would have had that surgery, probably living. The reason he doesn't have it is because he's in prison. He can't do those things. Well, the, 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 reason, the reason those things weren't, the reason those things, uh, weren't done is because of the UMass scheduling. That it was not, it was not BOP. But it's not because of the UMass scheduling. That's what I'm saying. He, he, it's, 
I don't get it. I mean, he's, he's in prison. He can't do anything. Right, but, but I mean. How do you mass even exist? How would he, I'm sorry, what was that? He doesn't even know UMass exists or is a part of this. Right, but... I think where we started this, the, the concern that, I mean, even today, are there... I mean, how would a prisoner even know to seek redress from UMass? So, in, in a situation like this, like I said, you could have been the uh, BOP administrative remedy, it could have been uh, hiring an attorney to, or you know, trying to uh, get family members perhaps to track down that information. Um, it could have come in the way of, People could you know, be like dead this. By or, then. Excuse me. People could be dead by then. In fact, he is. But and he was sick when you brought when you brought him there. You tra they transferred him to Butler for medical reasons. Is that correct? Yes, correct. And then and when when so. You, he trans they transferred him down to Butner, which is a medical facility. Correct. He taken care of. Yes. And then you all had this contract, and you, and when you got sued, you came in and and uh, in, interposed the independent contractor doctrine and the discretionary function doctrine. Mm -hmm. And right. and you win you won on the independent contractor doctrine. Well, it, it was also in the discretionary function, which is another part of my argument that I think ties into a lot of what we're discussing here, because a lot of it goes back to why, you know, why can't BOP do more? Why didn't they follow up? Well, it has to do with resources and manpower. And when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're trying to sort out resources and manpower, um, those are, you know, I think recognized by just about every court that those are, those are matters of policy. Mm -hmm. And so the decision not to follow up with UMass was based upon, you know, the lack of manpower and lack of resources to do that. But and so if they have, if they lack the resources and manpower to put that in the contract, they're not going to have power to do it in the real world. Listen to me just for a minute. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is UMass providing all the medical services that are provided now at Butner? No, BOP provides its own primary care. They schedule primary care and they, they provide primary care. It's specialty care. You, got a big hospital. you have a big hospital there at Butner, and that's why he was transferred down there because you've got the medical facility, correct? Uh, yes, because based on his medical condition and the facilities at Butner, yes. That's right. And so, and the and the relationship with the UMass was was basically secret. It's all sealed up. This contract. Uh, I mean, it's sealed for purposes of this case, but it's not. It's not secret. Uh, it's not secret from the public. I don't, I'm not aware of of any hindrances. How did it be sealed up for this case then? If it's not, if it's not secret. It, it was sealed not, up. It, it was sealed up for this particular not, we case. Seal things, we seal up things in, the, in, in these court cases when they're top secret or classified or something. Uh, well, that, these, these are not involved in them. Right. For some reason, this contract that you're pleading on the basis of this independent contractor doctrine is sealed. Yes, it was sealed based upon the the content or the language of the contract was some type of proprietary language. It wasn't keep to keep it secret from everybody that UMass is scheduling. It was due to the proprietary language in the contract. Where, 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 is there a UMass scheduler on site at Butner? Yes, as, as reflected in Dr. Uh, Dr. Stark's uh, uh, affidavit uh, right. regarding regarding this, it's an on site it's an on site scheduler for UMass. It's a UMass employee. So Judge Spacker and I just didn't dream that. We both no that. no no that that is very much based in reality. And and that and that UMass scheduler was advised along the way of what was going on here. The UMass scheduler, in, 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 whenever the URC for Butner approved the special the specialty care request for Mr. Krimble, and they were immediately forwarded to the UMass scheduler, at that point, the UMass scheduler was aware of the need for that appointment. And once the UMass scheduler schedules the appointment, then the scheduler notifies BOP of the appointment, and then BOP's obligation to ensure the medical care is received by the patient takes place in the form of transporting the patient to and from the specialty care. 
That's right. And you, but you're, you're giving us all that in the context of a hypothetical. I'm asking you, in this case, as to this plaintiff, the, the UMass scheduler was advised along yes. the way. And yes, the UMass, that, scheduler, UMass scheduler was supposed to have scheduled this surgery. Correct. I believe it was within uh, 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 as quickly as, as soon as possible or within a couple of weeks, I think from July to October, and then within a week uh, from the October uh, approval for a specialty care request. So did the UMass scheduler drop the ball or did, did somebody up, uh, above him at UMass drop the ball? I, I, I cannot speak for a UMass employee. Um, you know, I, 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 I can only summarize. I can only summarize that the appointment that BOP recommended be done with a week, within a week, at the end of October, um, wasn't done, and that within three or four weeks, by the third or fourth week in November, about 30 days later, uh, Mr. Krimble did the administrative remedy request and got an appointment right away, and they were able to determine that at that point in December, not October, but in December 2013, it was uh, too late for the Mohs surgery. Now, um, I don't know uh, how much more time I have, but it, it's I don't been. Think uh, we probably don't have any more time. Okay. Uh, we've taken, we've, we've taken uh, a lot of your time to ask you a lot of questions. Do you have anything but, you want to add? Well, I was going to say there, there, a lot of what is being discussed revolves around what choices BOP made regarding the contract, the contract terms, and the choices they made in this specific case. And I just like to, uh, I would submit to the court that those choices, um, are, that arise from the 4042 language, which I, I think the court would agree is, is is very general in nature and doesn't mandate any specific actions by BOP. That the choices and uh, judgment that BOP utilizes in entering the contract, the terms of that contract, and in this specific case, not following up with the UMass scheduler, that is consistent with the discretionary function exception to uh, the sovereign immunity waiver in the uh, in the Federal Tort Claims Act. And so I would just, you know, I would just, uh, you know, remind the court that it wasn't just the independent contractor. It was the fact that the choices BOP made in this case were uh, products of discretionary function as well. And that all these. The, the, and the failure, failure of, of uh, UMass to get this fellow scheduled and to take good care of him would be, would must be a breach of your contract with him, right? I don't know if that would be a material breach. I think there are, uh, while BOP certainly does not have day-to-day -day, uh, operations, I well, think they do the have uh, a general he oversight. He get the surgery that the doctor said he needed and he died. Well, he, he died he during died. this appeal. He did not die in BOP. He, he was treated. He did not get the most surgery, but he was treated with radiation in December 2013, and I believe that uh, – while it, while a wound would never heal completely, I believe that uh, successfully attacked a cancer that was uh, that was a problem at that time in December 2013. Okay. But it was only recently it was only recently that Mr. Krimble passed away. Well, let's see what Mr. Craven says about this. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors, for the time. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Good afternoon, and may it please the court. Uh, Craven, I have. Good to be here. I have a number of things I would like to say. Uh, first of all, uh, we have no quarrel with the University of Massachusetts, nor with any doctors involved in Mike Kremble's care. As far as we're concerned, the doctors did their job. Uh, we had no inkling that the University of Massachusetts or any other academic institution was involved in this matter until the government's answer was filed. And the contract was completely sealed. There was no way, in our opinion, of anyone learning about it other than the way we learned about it, by filing suit and having the government say, well, it, it wasn't our fault, it was the University of Massachusetts. Uh, so it was, uh, I think Judge King used the word secret, it was a secret agreement. Uh, how anyone, any inmate at Butner could possibly know of the involvement of the University of Massachusetts is a mystery to us. The BOP cannot contract out of their statutory 
responsibility to provide care. And that's what they are attempting to do in this case. The BOP, the government, could have brought the University of Massachusetts into this case had they wanted to do so. Uh, we have never uh, acknowledged that Michael Kremble had any relationship with the University of Massachusetts, contractual or otherwise. And and by the way, it's our understanding, and and I, I may be wrong. I can't I can't swear to it, but I don't believe that the University of Massachusetts scheduler has ever been physically present at Butner. I think that person uh, is has always been in Massachusetts. Uh, again, I can't cite chapter and verse on that. Uh, Dr. Cook, Dr. Jonathan Lambert Cook, at the, who is the leading Mohs surgeon at Duke, in October 2013, uh, as Mr. Renfer indicated, did not say it was too late for the Mohs surgery then. It wasn't too late. But in December, it was. Uh, and, and I sensed uh, an interest there on the part of the government in shifting a little of the blame for all this on to Dr. Cook, which I think is unfair. Uh, I would also like to speak up for my, my late dear friend, Judge Fox, down in Wilmington. I think, Judge, I think Judge Fox got this matter right when he heard and ruled on the government's initial motion to dismiss. When Judge Flanagan heard it later on, after she got the case, she had nothing before her that Judge Fox had not had except the secret government contract with the University of Massachusetts. And that contract, which is in the record, makes an ordinary insurance policy read like poetry. Uh, and I don't think that it um, could possibly have have added anything to this to the case. Uh, Judge Fox can't speak for himself anymore, any more than Mike Crumble can. But uh, so but, I mean, in a sense but didn't it? But didn't it add the independent contractor uh, exception to the case? Yeah. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Say that. Didn't again, it, you said that the contract didn't add anything to the case that Judge Fox didn't have. But didn't the contract um, coming to light add the independent contractor exception to the case? No, I don't think so at all. Why I don't not? Think so at all. And it can't because, it, it, you know, the, the government can contract all sorts of things out, but they, the one thing they cannot contract out is their statutory obligation under 4042 to provide care. Uh, you know, Judge uh, Judge Fox said in his in his order, <coughs> excuse me, that a more fully developed record may reveal that UMass was negligent and the defendant was not. But I don't think that's the case. We do not have any complaint against the University of Massachusetts. So Judge uh, Fox I, knew that UMass Judge Fox knew that UMass was involved in things some way or another. He knew that they had some involvement with it. Yes, he knew they had some involvement. They were they were to provide the they were, they had well, a I contract think... to provide the medical services. That's right. Uh, that's right. And uh, and that's what they are. And and that's an exception to the Federal Tort Claims Act, Mr. Craven. And, yes, it is. And and the Federal Tort Claims Act has to be strictly construed, and it's only a waiver of sovereign immunity. Uh, in limited circumstances, I I, I absolutely and agree. With, and that's I what I saw the table there from you is, is arguing about. He says this this independent contractor exception and this uh, discretionary function doctrine both take this claim out of the Federal Tort Claims Act. Oh, and that is and and gives the government sovereign immunity. There's no waiver in this context. That's the that, argument the government's made. 
that is indeed the argument the government's making, and I think they're dead wrong uh -huh. because they cannot contract, <coughs> excuse me, contract out of their statutory duty to take care of these folks in prison. They cannot pass that on to the University of Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, the BOP is clearly negligent here, clearly. And, you know, maybe the University of Massachusetts is too, but the remedy there is for the BOP to bring them into this case, which they did not do. And the government uh, mentioned that, that there hadn't been you any could have brought them into the case. Uh, pardon? Could you have brought them into the case? Could we have? Yeah, that's what you're saying. That you're saying the government didn't bring them in. I mean, Europe. We had no bar, reason, to, like that other fellow is up there. We had no reason to bring them in. The okay. government might wanted might have wanted to bring them in by way of contribution. Uh, the government uh, mentioned that there had been no FOIA requests. I don't know how they. I don't know how they think we got the Crumble's medical records without a FOIA request. Well, we'll do our best. To, your bell went off there, Mr. Craven. It's and good to see you. And uh, we're going to take this thing. We're going to take this thing under advisement. And if we were in Richmond, we would leave the bench now and. Uh, <laughs> Judge Wynn and Judge Stacker and I, and we'd come down and shake hands with you fellas and tell, you, tell each of you you did a fine job. Well, I've uh, done that many. I always look forward to that in Richmond. And, and, and we appreciate it very you. much. And may that, may that day come again. Mm -hmm. We're going to do that. It's going to come again. Thank and, you, Judge. Thank uh, you all so much. Thank you. Madam Thank Clerk. You. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Adjourn court and uh, until tomorrow. Yes, right, sir. Everybody. everybody, take care. This honorable court stands adjourned until tomorrow. God save the United States and this honorable court. I will call the judges back.